The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. To the fear you can hear. Horror that makes the flesh crawl as with maggots. Terror that turns the brain to jelly. These mark the work of Edgar Allan Poe. For nearly a century and a half, readers have wondered at the mad creations of his fevered brain, even as their blood ran cold with fear, as shall yours. It comes. What comes? It. Here. It stopped. It stands outside my door. What, what stands outside that door? See. Ah! Oh! Good Lord, help us. Please, God, help us. Our mystery drama, The Fall of the House of Usher, was especially adapted from the Edgar Allan Poe classic for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back with Act One. I must warn you that there lies ahead for you a tale so gruesome that when it ends, you will know beyond doubt that never in your life before have you experienced such revulsion. Are you prepared for this? Come then to a certain room where a man named Gabriel Mannering sits writing in his diary. A certain room in the house of Usher. I sit here writing this diary when in truth were I not a fool I should have already departed this frightful place. Already I have sensed such horrors in these first hours of my visit that I, I tremble at the thought of what may be in store for my friend Roderick Usher and for me. During the whole of this dull, dark autumn day, I had passed on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country and at length found myself, as the shades of evening grew on, within a view of this bleak and melancholy house, the house of Usher. I felt at once an iciness, a sickening of my heart, and wondered what it was that so unnerved me. I was soon to find out. You would be Mr. Mannering, sir? Yes. My master waits you. Uh, one moment, this one way. moment, my horse. Oh, we'll be well cared for, sir. Mm. Oh, that carriage standing there. That black carriage. Is there another visitor? Only the doctor. He's attending Miss Madeline. Uh, this way, sir. Thank you. Follow me now, sir. Mm. Oh. We turn here. The passage on our left. Hmm. Now, this to the right. I had no idea the house of Usher was so vast. Ah, oh, yes. Vast. Above and below. Below? There are chambers underground, vaults, dungeons that even I have never seen. And I have lived here as servant to Mr. Usher more than 30 years. Ah, oh. oh, here we are, sir. Come. Mr. Gabriel Mannering, sir. Oh, Gabriel. Mm. My dear good friend, you've come. You've come at last. Roderick, I came immediately on receipt of your letter. It gave me cause for concern. 
deep concern. After all, Roderick, not having seen each other in years, nor corresponded even, to receive a letter from you was in itself a surprise. But the contents, Roderick, the contents were a shock. How ill are you? Ill? I'm not ill. Not ill? But in your letter... I am not ill! Oh, I... I... I may have mentioned something of the sort in my letter, but more than mentioned, you spoke of acute bodily illness, of oppressive mental disorder, of a malady, a malady, dear friend, so strange you could not bear to face it alone. Now, that is why I'm here. That is why I came at once. A terrible agitation in your letter. Oh, mood, mood, mood. It was nothing but mood. Uh, mood of the moment, nothing more, nothing more. Come now. Uh, uh, oh, Cato, the port. Good, good, good. Thank you, thank you. I, 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 I'll pour. I'll pour. And, oh, uh, Cato. Sir? Dr. Wyndham is with my sister still? Yes, sir. I would speak with him before he takes his leave, if he feels I can bear to... Sir? Nothing. Nothing. Just, just say I wish to see him. Yes, sir. Ah. Uh, vintage port, Gabriel. You'll enjoy it. It's, it's aroma. It's fragrant bouquet will delight your nostrils. Mm. Its taste will fall sweet on your tongue. Your, your health, good friend. And yours, Roderick. Well, now, tell me about mm. yourself, Gabriel. How has life gone with you all these years? Oh, as all lives go, I suppose. Has been the good, the bad, indifferent. Yes, well, mine has been mostly bad. Uh, I've prospered. My importing business in Baton Rouge. Ruination, that's been my lot, my fate. The fate of the House of Usher. Well, uh, if... If you are financially in need... No, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. I, I, I speak of another kind of ruination. Decadence. I speak of the evil. The evil that molders within my body, my mind, my house. House? Oh, no. No house, this. A tomb. A tomb that houses the living dead. You are ill. Yes. Yes, I lied. I, I am ill with... What? With what? With... With fear. Fear? Of what? I know not. Well, what do we all fear, each of us? What living thing has not known fear? It yes. lives within us, this fear. It rots within us as I rot within this house. But mark you, good friend, whereas with others fear rides like a restless maggot only now and again with me. With me, it's ever-present, a colorless slime growing within me, spreading, engulfing, drowning me. Drowning Roderick. me! Roderick! No, no, no! I'm... I'm all right now. I'm all right. You... You must go. Go? Well, you shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have asked you. You must leave this house, this house of death, this... this... this tomb. Stop that. Now stop. I tell you... To... Enough. Enough now. Here. Sit down. Compose yourself. Now hear me, Roderick. I came a great distance through the foulest time of the year to be with you. And here I shall stay until you are well again. No, you don't understand. I shall never get well. Of course you will. No, oh, no. No, she is dying, you see. And I... I... Your sister... Is it she who is dying? Yes. Yes, Madeline. But it's she who is dying. If it is... No, no, she... you don't understand. You don't understand. Uh, come in. Dr. Wyndham. Ah, come in, doctor. Uh, thank you, Cato. May I introduce myself, doctor? Mr. Usher, as you see, is not himself. I'm a friend of his. Gabriel Manning of Baton Rouge. <laughs> oh, how do you know? <laughs> Louis Wyndham. <laughs> I entreat your pardon, both of you. Shh, now, now, Roderick. My nerves, my nerves sometimes. Yes, yes, I know, and I'm sure Mr. Mannering understands. Uh, 
You've been taking the laudanum I prescribed now. Oh, yeah. I used the last only yesterday. Well, I'll see that you get more. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My sister. There's no change. How long? How long? Before death. I don't know. Your sister's malady baffles me. I don't know what is killing her, nor do I know what keeps her alive, when in truth, she's all but dead. Oh, would it be an impertinence, Doctor, for me to ask you what you mean by that? Well, no, no, Mr. Mannering. Quite simply, there have been times when Miss Usher, uh, Madeline, has been devoid of all vital signs. And by this, I mean I've been unable at these times to detect a pulse, blood pressure, any respiration whatsoever. Mm, yes. And yet, moments later, she's opened her eyes and returned to the world of the living. So strange, speak. strange. I've encountered nothing like it in years of practice. It's not too far from the truth to say that she is dead, and yet she lives on. Yes, yes. Like the house itself. Now, Roderick, you mustn't harp I tell on... you, we are like this house, my sister and I. We are this house. The house is us. The house is dead, and yet it stands. Your aberration about this house... It is, is no so... aberration! It's the truth. The house of Usher crumbles, yet it will not fall. Madeline is dead, yet she will not die. And as for me, oh, heaven, the horror that awaits me. <laughs> I'll send the laudanum as soon as possible, Mr. Mannering. There's little else I can do. Yes. I have other patients to attend. Oh, no. <sighs> Thank heavens it's a moonlit night. I have many miles to travel. Uh, good night. Good night. Roderick. Roderick. Yeah, yes? Roderick, I want to help you in every way I can. That's why I'm here. But now, you must do your part to help yourself. Well, what do you mean? Well, I could be wrong, but it, it seems to me you... Let yourself go to pieces all too easily. This this talk, this wild talk of your sister Madeline being dead and yet alive. Well, now, that's nonsense, you know. No, no, no. Yes, well, I, well, I'll agree with you with one thing and one thing only. In a way, you have become this damnable house. No healthy sane man could live here for long without beginning to lose his sanity, without serious damage to his nervous system. <sighs> I've... Never seen such gloom. Inside as well as out. This very room reeks of dejection, despondency, undusted cobweb furnishings, black drapes covering the window. Here, let me throw them back and at least get some moonlight, if not sunlight, into this place. There, that's... Roderick. What is it? There's a graveyard. I can see it in the moonlight. The family graveyard, yes. Who... Who would be walking in it at night? Oh, what do you say? Well, where do you see the... There. There. Amidst the headstones. Oh! It's Madeline. What is she doing out there? Oh, we better go and find out. Good Lord. In the doorway. What is it? Oh! Madeline! Am I that horrifying to look upon, dear brother? Madeline Usher walks among the headstones of the Usher graveyard, yet stands in the doorway at the same time. Does her spirit walk abroad? Is she that close to death? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Again, I must ask if you wish to go on and warn that if you do, you will experience a kind of horror for which I can find no words. Even Gabriel Mannering, writing in his diary, 
found it difficult to express his feelings in that moment of first meeting with Madeline Usher. I seek and cannot find words to recreate the terror of that moment. Not a woman, but a corpse stood before us in the doorway of that awful room. The very woman, or corpse, if you will, that but an instant before Roderick Usher and I had glimpsed in the moonlight graveyard beyond the window. If she is alive, I thought, she should be dead. Fatuously, I said, You are Madeline Usher? Yes. How do you do? I'm Gabriel Mannering. I know. Ah, you winced as you took my hand. What? You felt its coldness. No, 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 no. I, uh... uh... Yes, yes. You need not dissemble with me. Even now you find it hard not to stare at the dark patches on my face. The putrescence that lives <laughs> yes, thrives in my dying flesh. Uh, Madeline, my dearest sister, you should be lying down, resting. You mustn't waste your energy. I wanted to meet your friend. Someone from the world of life outside this house, this tomb. I wanted to... need it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's a falling catch. Uh -huh. I have it. <laughs> Let's put her on the couch, Gabriel. No, 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 no. But still, we'll, we'll carry her to her room. There's no pulse. No heartbeat. You see? Well, uh, heaven help me. It's, it's impossible to say. Can you carry her alone? She weighs nothing. Well, follow me then. Oh, what evil stalks the house of Usher. Help us, dear Lord, please help us. Put her down, Gabriel. Gabriel? In what? In that? It's her bed. A coffin? Well, nevertheless, it is her bed. It's where she rests and sleeps. And haven't you noticed... What she's wearing isn't a nightdress. A shroud? Yes. She's been ready for her burial for nearly a year now. Oh, oh. look, look, see? Her eyes, her eyes are fluttering. I'd have taken my oath she was dead. Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Gabriel, my friend, come. Well, you don't leave her like this, alone, no company to cheer her when she wakes. She may not waken again for days. She may not waken again. Come? No. Oh, no, wait. There's something, something about her. Something in her face that it reminds me. Well, of course, it's, it's you. Oh, you, you see, then, mm -hmm. the family resemblance. Obvious. In spite of what the intimacy of death has done to the face, the resemblance is still there. It's more than a resemblance, Gabriel. What do you mean? Well, we are twins. As my friend spoke those words in that chamber of death, a curious change came into his face. It floats before me even now as I write, a complexion gone so suddenly cadaverous, his eyes large, liquid and luminous beyond comparison, thin and pallid lips gone thinner, paler. For a moment... He seemed scarce human. I had tried to calm his fevered nerves by telling him it was his sister, not he, who was dying. And he had cried out... Now you don't understand! You don't understand! And now, in an instant, I did understand, or at least the shadow of what he meant touched me, and I was filled with a dread, a loathing of what was to come that I cannot fully express. Had I known the full truth of what lay before us... My loathing would have increased a hundredfold, and I should have fled the house of Usher then and there. Certainly, I should not have found myself at breakfast with Usher the following morning. Another helping, Mr. Mannering? No more, Cato. Uh, then I can give you the message. A message from whom? Miss Madeline. She wishes to see you at your convenience. Well, then I'll go to her, of course. 
Now, why do you look at me like that? And now, why do you turn away? Cato, face me. Look at me. What is it? Cato, is it the odor? Uh, yes, sir. You'd best not go, Gabriel, or if you do, another time. No, I don't understand. The odor, the stench of putrefaction. It's stronger at times than at others. And you mean that she... Take me to Miss Madeline at once, Cato. No, no. It will sicken you, nauseate you, even infect you. Well, it can kill me and be damned to it, but I'll not disregard a last wish of a dying woman. Unlike you, Roderick, I do not fear death. <laughs> Sasha. Madeline. I, 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 Are you too tired to speak now? No. Would you prefer I came back another time? No. How good of you to come at all. It's a privilege to be of use to you. A favor. I wish a favor. Anything in my power. I want to die. I'm in such pain and I want to die, but I cannot. Cannot? I'm... I'm afraid. There's nothing to fear. Death is only sleep, a dreamless sleep. No, don't fear death. I, I don't. I fear. I fear. What? You fear what? Burial alive. Why would you have such a fear? Oh. What makes you think you might be buried alive? My, my mother. She? Uh, oh, promise me. Uh, spare yourself. Spare yourself. You need say no more. I promise. Oh. I promise you that you will not be buried alive. Oh. Oh. Rest. Rest now. Rest. That is what you meant, Roderick, is it not? Like her, like your twin, you don't fear death so much as you fear being buried alive. Well, that's part of my fear. Yes. Only part? Well, I fear... Oh, God, more than I can tell you. I, 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 I fear what happens in death. Another aberration. As with the house, so with this. You are a man given to aberration. And what of that? You make as little sense as Wyndham. You think because you call a thing a, an aberration, it'll go away. That it will cure itself if you but name it. Reason. Common sense. Reason. Common sense. Well, you speak to me, to me, an usher of reason and common sense, hmm? Do you not know of the madness that has tainted this family through its history? From the beginnings of the house of usher, this house, this, this family... Until now, until Madeline and me, the last of the ushers, from beginning to end, from rise to... to fall. Roderick. Rise to fall. Roderick. From rise to fall. I, I had not thought on it before, but that is what it will be when, when, when she and I are dead. <laughs> it will be the fall, the fall of the house of Asher. Um. Yes, Cato. The laudanum, <laughs> sir, from Doctor Windham. Oh, thank heaven! It has come none too soon. <laughs> Yes, yes, Cato. You've been sitting here in the graveyard for nearly two hours. That long? Yes, sir. Tell me, Cato, how long have you been servant to Mr. Usher? More than 30 years, sir. But I... I thought I told you that the night you arrived just a week ago. Did you? Now, then I forgot. Were you here when the mother died? The mother of Mr. Roderick and Miss Madeline. Why do you ask such a question, no, Miss Mannering? I don't know, really, except... I've been dwelling on what Miss Madeline told me of, about her mother. 
Buried alive. Was she indeed? Sir, don't ask such questions. Don't dwell on such thoughts. Why not? It was discovered the mother had been buried alive. Yes. Tell me about it. Sir, I entreat you. Understand. You cannot stay in the house of Usher. No one can without something. I... I know not what, but something evil. Taking possession of his mind, his spirit, his very soul. It will happen to you. It is happening to you. No. You've been drawn here to this spot. You've been sitting here in the damp and chill for hours because you, too, have taken the first step toward madness. How did they discover she'd been buried alive? Sir, I beg you, turn your thoughts away from... How? If you must hear it, a few weeks after she had been buried, the coffin placed in that vault you see under the trees, it was discovered that she had been buried wearing a valuable ring. A ring? It contained a stone worth a fortune. It had been hers. She had always worn it, and when the undertaker encoffined her, he neglected to remove it. He had no idea of its worth, or surely he'd have inquired whether the family wished her to wear it to the grave. And as you will understand, such was Miss Madeline's and Mr. Roderick's grief. They didn't think of the ring until weeks later. And decided to retrieve it. Yes. We went to the vault, the three of us, slid back the slab that covers it, and... Uh, sir, let us go in. Finish. Finish what you're telling me. There lay the coffin. The lid was in two parts. A lower part that covered her body from the waist down. An upper part from the waist up. This I pried up. And there... There... Go on. She lay face down. Her hands... Her hands had torn chunks of hair out by the roots. Such was the agony of terror. Hands, do I say? Claws. They had become rigid in the death throes. Yes. Yes. We turned her over. Ah, uh, her face, I... Oh, my God, we with us. Her face, I... I cannot describe. I, I, I cannot. I cannot. I, 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 <laughs> Enough. Enough, then. Oh, the chill is getting to me. No, no! Mary! <laughs> Quickly. Come. <laughs> Heaven help us. What is that? They're coming toward us from the house. Roderick! Help me! What? Help me! Roderick! What is it, man? A corpse! A corpse! What? Oh, Madeline! Dead! She's dead at last! Dead! But, 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 no, no, no. What, what? What is it? She tried to take me to the grave with her! She tried to drag me into her coffin! Oh, no, no, no! Roderick! Roderick, pull yourself together uh, and tell us! I, I, I went to her chamber to see how she was! <laughs> called her name again and again and yes. again and no answer. I felt for a pulse, none. I, I lay my head against her breast, no heartbeat, and then, oh God, her arms were entwined around my neck, her cold arms around my neck, and I tried, I tried to break free, but I couldn't, I couldn't. I grabbed her wrists and I tore, I tore. Her arms from around me. And... Yeah. Sir, I've got him. Ah. Help me carry him inside. Ooh. Oh, no. I'll be calm, Cato. When Mr. Usher tore himself free, he must have dragged her half out of the coffin. Come. We must put her back in. Cato. I dare not touch her. Very well. Uh, 
There. Is she at last dead? She seems so. Ride for the doctor. Tell him to come at once. Yes, sir. Sir, you mean to stay here? Yes. But I will be gone at least two hours. Should you change your mind, you'll not be able to find your way back to the library in that maze of corridors. Now don't worry about it. I shall stay here. I made her a promise that she'd not be buried alive, and I mean to keep that promise, Cato. Beginning now. Alone in that chamber of death, within the house of Usher, Gabriel Mannering seats himself beside the coffin of Madeline Usher to keep his vigil and his promise, and wonders if he himself may not be going mad. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Terror so awful as to shatter the human mind haunts the house of Usher, hangs like a shroud in the air, drips on the spirit like the very slime upon the decaying walls. As Gabriel Mannering sits beside the coffin of Madeline Usher, he feels this terror seeping into him. Seeping into me like a rising tide of pollution. Cato said he would be gone two hours in fetching Dr. Wyndham, but to me, it seemed like 20 before I heard his returning footsteps. You don't look well. I'm all right. Sir, you deceive yourself. Ah, Never mind now, I'm seeing Miss Usher. My bag, Cato. Thank you. Heart first. Mm -hmm. Is she? No, there's no heartbeat. None whatever. No pulse. No vital signs at all. She is gone, then. Hey, Mr. Mannering, I have attended her in this strange illness for nearly a year. I've seen her in this state four times before. What's to be done? <laughs> what, indeed? Well, I would wait a few days at least, and then, and then I should bury her. No. No? She feared to be buried alive. Yes, I know. Her mother. You attended her? No, no. Another man. From what I've been able to learn, I judge her illness was similar, just as unaccountable as baffling. Well, Mr. Mannering, she did indeed fear the same fate her mother suffered, but I should think that after, say, three or four days... I say no. At least. At least a week. No. No, two. Even three. You don't know what you're saying. You can't keep a body for two or three weeks. Especially hers. Why, especially hers? Well, look at her, man. Here. See? Under the skin of the cheeks. Those gray patches. She's partially decomposed already. I gave her my word, doctor. I said we would make sure... There is an evil in this house. A sinister, malevolent thing that fastened itself on the ushers years ago. And is beginning to fasten itself on you. Now hear me out. I have not seen you in some days. But the moment I came into this room, I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. The change in you. The sickening in you. The... I do not use this word lightly, Mr. Mannering. The insanity in you. (laughs) You are right. I, too, have sensed, well, no matter. I am not given easily to fancies either. However, I am given to honoring a promise. I gave Madeline Usher my word she would not be buried alive, and she will not be. No. I see that I cannot dissuade you. Very well. Do as you wish. And may God help you. I stayed by her coffin for yet another hour or so. 
making sure there were no signs of life. Then I returned to the library, led there, of course, by Cato, for I, well, I could never have found my own way through that maze of corridors and passages. I found Roderick Usher seated bolt upright in a wing chair, staring at I know not what. I... Roderick. Roderick, I must talk to you. Do you hear me? Yes. Now, Roderick, as I told you, I promised your sister to take every precaution against her being buried alive. She is dead. I know it in my heart, my soul. I know it. I believe so, too. But we must be certain. Now, that presents a problem. Roderick, are you listening? Problem. Yes. Decomposition. If she is dead, she will decompose. And after a period of days, well, if you could imagine... Days? Days of what? Of visiting her coffin at least every 12 hours, say, to make sure she's dead. Are you mad? We must keep her body. One week, two. And the question is, where? Where? We'll have to leave the coffin open in case she should regain her senses. On the other hand, if she is indeed dead, the Well, there are, there, there, there are vaults deep down beneath the house. We could put the coffin in one of those. Good, good, good. We'll do that then. Yes, we'll do just that. <laughs> Together, Usher and I arranged for the temporary entombment of Madeline, his twin. The vault, so long unopened that our torches were half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, was small, damp, and entirely without means of admission of light, lying at great depth beneath the house. There. There, Gabriel. It is done. We must come here again. In no more than 12 hours. As you say. As you say. Before he wished only to bury Madeline, why now did Roderick become so compliant? Agree so readily with what I said. If only I'd ask myself that question. But I did not, and in consequence faced an unexpected problem. Why do you not believe me? It isn't that I don't believe you, Roderick, but I wish to see for myself. There is no need for you to do it. I have done it. You have? I have visited the coffin at least once every 12 hours, sometimes twice. She does not live. Take my word for it. It is my word that concerns me. I gave my word to her, not yours. She is dead. I assure you, she is dead. It was about that time the sounds began. The strange knockings, creaking. Perhaps it had begun before, but I had not heard it first. But I would hear some curious sound from below and say to Roderick, What was that? What was what? Listen. What is that? Rats, perhaps. Rats? Well, you know, the house is infested with them. I've never heard rats make sounds like that. I answered. Time went on. And it seemed to me the sounds grew louder, and I would say to Roderick, listen. And he would answer. A door banging in the wind somewhere. And I would say, but there is no wind, and he would answer. Well, then it's something else. Don't bother me. And then on that fatal night, that fatal night, as we sat in the library, he just sitting, staring vacantly at nothing, I trying to read, but my mind focused on that awful chamber of death far below and outside the wind gathering for a storm. It happened. I became aware of distinct, hollow, metallic, yet muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet and looked at Usher. His eyes were fixed before him. And throughout his whole countenance, there reigned a stony rigidity. I said, Roderick, do you not hear it? Yes, I hear it and have heard it. As you have. 
Long, long, many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not. I dared not speak. No. No, touch me not. I am accursed. Accursed. For I heard the sounds as did you, but I dared not speak and dared not go. Not go? My God, are you telling me? That not once, not once have I gone down to sea. I dared not. I dared not. We put her living in the tomb. She comes. She comes for me. Listen. Now listen and know. We've heard the rending of the coffin, the grating of the iron hinges of her prison, her struggles within the carpet archway of the vault, and now, now... She comes for me. In a moment, she'll be here. I hear her footsteps on the stair. I hear the horrible beating of her heart. She comes for me. She comes. I tell you, she stands outside the door. <laughs> In the superhuman energy of his utterance, there had been found the potency of a spell. The huge antique panels to which he pointed drew slowly back. And outside those doors did stand the towering and enshrouded figure of Miss Madeline. There was blood on her white robes and evidence of some bitter struggle on every portion of her putrefied frame. For an instant, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. And then, with a moaning cry, fell heavily inward on her brother. And in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor. A corpse. A victim to the terrors of all he had anticipated. This is E.G. Marshall. I shall return shortly. The manuscript of the fall of the House of Usher ends thus. I fled from the house, leaving all behind me. As I ran, I heard a sound so horrendous it made me stop and turn. My brain reeled as, looking back, I saw the mighty walls of the house burst asunder. And in a few moments, the moon, breaking through the scudding clouds, a blood-red moon, revealed the end. The fall of the House of Usher. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Arnold Moss, Marion Seldes, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. All right, Mr. Thompson, I'm a human being, too, and I guess if I got a letter from Drees, Hartog, and whatever telling me that I was rich, I wouldn't go into mourning. I'd probably go out and celebrate. Believe me, I understand very well. That's why I wanted to see you, to suggest arranging that happy event without the slightest trouble on your part, without any obligation until you're completely satisfied. What the devil does that mean? All you have to do is say yes. Just that one word and your dream will come true. Yes to what? In a short time, you'll receive another letter from Johannesburg informing you of the sad news that your cousin, Mr... Well, I still won't reveal his name. Let him remain anonymous. That'll make your decision a great deal easier, I'm sure. What decision? The decision to inherit his estate. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.